Thank you. Um, thanks so much. Um, I hope you can see my my whole screen and you can you can hear me well. If something changes, let me know. Um, but I'm really excited to be here and and see the panel of speakers. I typically when we're invited for these talks, it's uh, I'm usually the only one working in the OBGYN space, uh, you know, in a field dominated by gut microbiome and skin microbiome and, and such. So this is really exciting. Um, our research does cover a lot of uh, benign GYN and OB um, as well, but I'll, I'll focus today more on the um, gynecologic cancers since I, I saw the panelists have uh, expertise in, in those other areas. And I think it will be nice to, to have a good, uh, a good span of, of topics. Um, so this will be really a uh, overview um, of what we we are doing, um, really as more of a brain teaser to for the discussion part of this, uh, which I really look forward to. Um, just to start here with a disclosure that um, Mayo Clinic Ventures does have a, entered a licensing agreement um, with a commercial partner that involves patents related to endometrial and ovarian cancer findings that I will mention here. Um, so that's something uh, they, they should know as I am listed as an inventor of those. So. All right, so just a really brief um, introduction on you know why why we're interested um, in endometrial cancer um, and, and ovarian cancer and, and why we think the microbiome might be a really interesting uh, way to, to help with these efforts. Um, so the diagnosis you can see here from 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 the seer cancer uh, status here on the most common cancers um, in in the U.S. Um, you can see that uh, endometrial cancer described here as uterine cancer is listed as number nine, so pretty uh, common cancer. Um, and you can see that ovarian cancer is not as common, but it it, it is responsible for the death of just about as many uh, uh, people as as uh, endometrial cancer. Yet none of those have any uh, screening tests. Uh, endometrial cancer is, is symptom driven. Uh, typically, uh, individuals come to the clinic with um, bleeding after menopause, which is a concerning sign that should be investigated by by a clinician to make sure rule out the presence of cancer. Um, ovarian cancer is very um, obscure uh, signs and manifests late as bloating and, and things like that that are pretty common and, and specific. So um, kind of a silent cancer until pretty late. Uh, I put cervical cancer here just as a comparison as to, you know, what things like screening um, uh, and, and identifying causative agents and vaccinations that we have now available, the kind of impact that can have, you can see that Cervical cancer um, it used to be a very common cancer, um, not so much in in, uh, in 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 the U.S. in in areas that that do uh, adhere to vaccination and and screening uh, protocols, um, and the deaths that that this cancer causes has dropped um, significantly because of a lot of those efforts. So these are the kinds of uh, things we try to to help with here. Uh, also to mention here, and this is something we, we highlighted back in 2018, me and my clinical partner, um, Andrea Mariani, that um, endometrial cancer is really um, clinically uh, driven by, by symptoms, but uh, it, it might not be um, uh, the best way to do this. And, and the reason is because um, it doesn't manifest the same way in all um, races and ethnicities, and in particular, Black women. Um, have have a much higher mortality due to this cancer because they they tend to develop more aggressive types of cancer that don't manifest um, the same way, um, and so we're really um, not adequately uh, serving those populations as is right now. And I'll touch back on that. Um, now, when I joined Mayo Clinic, uh, Andrea Mariani was very uh, insistent with me that I should look into endometrial cancer um, and really look into microbiome aspects of it because he suspected there was something related to potential inflammation or something uh, to, to that effect. And so we, we started putting this study together, which uh, took quite a bit of effort uh, to get started. It was the first study um, done in, in endometrial cancer, and it required um, I guess me to spend three years in uh, learning OR, you know, uh, protocols, how to how to how to function in, a, in an OR as I didn't have medical training, and in a pathology uh, frozen section as well, um, how to uh, you know collect when to collect the right samples, what times when it was a good time when it wouldn't influence the diagnosis and impact uh, time turnaround times and and, and diagnostic procedures. So, um, but we ended up doing the study, and what you can see here in Figure A. Um, 
is that we we did a spatial study because we didn't know this hadn't been looked into with the microbiome on, on these tissues. And so we uh, looked uh, to see if there was any difference between uh, the microbiome present in the tissues in different areas of the uterus. Um, and we, we identified that not really, which really simplified our life uh, moving forward, that we really didn't have to collect as many samples as, as we did at the beginning uh, for follow-up studies. Um, you can see here in the PCA that we were able to distinguish the groups of women who had endometrial cancer um, versus those that did not have endometrial cancer but were undergoing a very similar surgery. Um, so we could tell just alone by the microbiome signature that um, they were statistically uh, distinct. Uh, we also were able in a follow-up study to look into that signature, that microbiome signature, and what, what exactly these microbes were. Um, and you can see here that, you know, performance samurai, which is one of those microbes kind of caught our attention in particular because of the uh, strong correlation with, with endometrial cancer, although uh, it's really a, an association of 17 microbes, as you see here with postmenopause being one of the risk factors um, and obesity. Obesity has its own cluster uh, that doesn't overlap uh, as much as postmenopause, but also um, something of interest to, to remember. Um, in this work, we, we kind of looked also into patients who had hyperplasia. This is kind of a precancer. Um, type 1, which is the most common type of endometrial cancer, and type 2 is a more aggressive type, um, more common in black women that tends to be a lot more difficult to treat. Um, and you can see that, that the microbes tend to increase in abundance. Uh, those 17 microbes that we find associated continue to increase in abundance through those types. Um, we also did a study where we looked at um, a blind test, uh, just a qPCR test to detect, detect this performance samurai in 150 um, women and, um, uh, and really detected that there was a positive predictive value um, of 0 0.86, uh, meaning that you know, if you, uh, particularly if you're postmenopausal and obese and you have this microbe in a vaginal swab, so we did this study with just a vaginal swab, um, there was an 86% chance that this, this individual had indeed endometrial cancer. So um, this was also detected in all type two endometrial cases, which are much more difficult uh, to detect as they don't tend to manifest um, as often with, with the bleeding, so. Uh, something that became very interesting for us to follow in terms of translational applications, but we are also investigating um, what, if this is just an association of correlation or whether uh, there's something more to it, right? Because uh, our main interest is really in the prevention, and if we can intercept things before they happen, that would be great. We have this hypothesis that maybe this uh, performance samurai is, you know, present, you know, not very common, but maybe it, it's present sometimes in, in premenopausal women and it's relatively happy while the menstrual cycle is ongoing and it has easy access to iron. This is a poor collator, so it needs easy access to iron. Um, but once that um, kind of menopause sets in and those cycles um, stop, uh, this microorganism is going to start struggling. And so we hypothesize that perhaps with the help of its cluster of microbes, um, it starts to try to get to the easier sources of iron, which is the intracellular um, iron. And so becoming invasive potentially. Uh, once inside the cell, it could, um, especially in the presence of beta estradiol, could activate their fumarate reductase um, pathway, which would produce as a, just a metabolism uh, outcome succinate into the cytosol in essence. Um, and this is already known in this part, but excess succinate in, uh, in the cytosol and, and cells can uh, block the prolyl hydroxylase domain, um, which, which then um, kind of stops the, um, or, or promotes the, the assembly of the hypoxia inducible factor, which is a, um, a factor that is um, associated with cell proliferation, um, expression, angiogenesis, metastases, and all those things. So we thought maybe, maybe this could be happening. So we had a um, I had this undergraduate student that, as you can see, printed a uh, an image of himself that is bigger than himself in my office before he left to the University of Minnesota, where he's now a graduate student. But uh, didn't want me to forget him, and uh, hard to forget when you have such a giant picture of himself in my office. But um, he did show that, uh, in fact, we we could find the bacteria um, inside the cells, and that they were able to to invade um, the the host cells. And he also showed that. Um, these cells were responsive to um, estradiol, although it wasn't like a, 
uh, you know, it, they don't grow uh, proportionally to, to estradiol. They just uh, grow more if there's any estradiol at all. So that was kind of the finding. And also that they, yes, they produce the succinate levels. Um, although again, not proportional to the estradiol levels, they just produce succinate um, as, a, as a part of their metabolism. And so we kind of demonstrated that um, this is a possibility in essence that this could be happening. Uh, right now, you know, we're still kind of investigating this and kind of moving forward with uh, utilizing now benign menstrual stem cells that we, uh, with the help of our Mayo Clinic collaborators in Florida, uh, Hugo and, and Chris, um, uh, have in our hands now and, and trying to study uh, chronic exposure to the bacteria to see what happens um, to the cells. Um, we are looking at its descriptome and we are uh, also injecting uh, um, mice with these cells that have been exposed to the bacteria to see whether they form tumors or not. Uh, we are about uh, about a month from finishing these experiments with some interesting results, but they're very preliminary. And so, uh, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to cover that, but but happy to entertain questions about this uh, as we as we continue to investigate what we we are finding. I uh, just want to touch briefly on um, you know ovarian cancer uh, a microbiome here because we did a similar study. Scott Kaufman is one of my mentors and in, in the ovarian cancer spore here, director here at Mayo. And they saw one of my talks once at Mayo and, uh, and and reached out to me and said, you have to do this in ovarian cancer because imagine the impact this could have for, for our patients in that, in that in this field. And so, you know, I embarked with them in this journey that, that we are pursuing and um, we published the work. It was similar work to the endometrial cancer. Uh, we did find some signatures present in ovarian cancer, although not as strong of a signature as it was in endometrial cancer, unfortunately. Um, but we did find something uh, a little more interesting in, in, the, in the tumor response and how the patients it basically is a predictor of tumor uh, of treatment response to patients um, and whether the patients were doing well even two years or four years later um, when we tested their microbiome, they were treatment naive. So. Um, the microbiome signature alone could predict whether these patients were, in essence, uh, going to respond well or not. Again, we don't know what the meaning of this, and we are investigating mechanistically also in the lab some of these things that we, we haven't published yet. Um, hopefully soon we'll, we'll get some work out um, about it. Um, but it's something that we are we are interested in, not just on the translational aspect, but also potentially in, uh, interfering with uh, and predicting at least uh, uh, types of responses we get from, from patients uh, to to chemotherapy and, and all the approaches physicians try. Um, something that uh, actually the, the, the previous uh, uh, speaker was talking about and I was very, very happy to hear. Uh, as we move forward, we know we, we understand now, uh, uh, and I believe I absolutely agree that I think longitudinal multi studies is what's going to answer a lot of these questions. Um, I think we all became uh, acutely aware of how, you know, fluctuations in microbiome. This is a study we have with Wellesley College that we have uh, published in our, is a continuing study, long-term study, but where we are looking at individuals um, vaginal microbiome uh, every day uh, for a period of uh, about 10 weeks um, at a time every year and continue to do this. Um, and uh, what's interesting to me is, you know, I always hear the criticism in microbiome often that you know, every time you look at the microbiome is different. How can you make any sense of it? You know, and what you can see here is that indeed, you know, uh, every day there's there's something different happening. Um, but if you just uh, step back and look at the big picture as you have it here and this participants, for example, you can easily uh, tell that those fluctuations belong to a particular individual. Um, the same thing on, on the one at the bottom, right? Uh, it's just a matter of, of uh, angle of how you look at this. And by the way, this, this uh, break here, uh, that you see in the middle of 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 the of the graph here is is spring break, where we the the individual stopped collecting and then returned and you know it continues to be pretty distinctive. Um, and this is year two, the same participants. You can see this participant remained fairly stable, and this one we actually caught a transition um, in in her microbiome during menstruation cycle that persisted uh, from then on. And we're very interested in is what we call the shifts uh, and whether that has any implications uh, in the short term or long term health and uh, things like that. We we also collected um, all kinds of information about daily activity, sexual activity, hygiene practices, all of that during this time, which is very, very interesting. Um, we also, uh, you know, in understanding the, the necessity also to understand these microbes at the species level and sometimes even strain level, we did a study um, uh, in Nigeria with, uh, with women um, 
with preterm labor delivery and normal delivery. And you can see how um, these different bacteria, this is a different species lactobacillus, but how, you know, even that, you know, some of them respond to estradiol concentrations and, and progesterone concentrations throughout the pregnancy in this case, and others are not responsive to that. And so it really, um, it really matters what kind of species or strains even we are talking about as they are, it can be very different and they are different between populations. So something we are also paying close attention to. Um, while we are thinking about all these new approaches, um, I, I want to mention this because it, it's a really important part of what, what we're also doing. Um, Karen Bartholomew, she's, she reached out to me uh, with this email, um, interested in, in the work we, we had published and, and wondering whether this could help uh, her efforts in New Zealand. Um, if you're familiar with endometrial cancer rates uh, in the US and, and in Europe, uh, this tends to be about 30 um, impacted women in per 100,000. And so you can see how this is drastically uh, worrying uh, in New Zealand, how, how, how much higher the rates are and, and how young the women are there being impacted. Uh, by this disease, um, and it's it's quite alarming, and and they they need help trying to figure this out. Why Pacific and Maori women are are uh, experiencing this, and so she's she's uh, we put together a grant uh, to 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 look into this and look at the microbiome markers, and uh, we're we're lucky to get that funded um, from from uh, New Zealand and and started that in this January. So that's really um, been very rewarding. Um, and this is actually uh, kind of almost changing my, my mind about so many things, just this experience. Um, this is kind of the group of scientists involved and Hoimata Tipene is uh, one of the patient um, advocates involved and uh, involved from the very beginning to design to uh, continuing the study and running the meetings, in fact, that we have um, at weekly. And it's been very eye-opening how much I have learned um, through that experience that is now changing the way I want to do science moving on. Um, also, they really convinced me that uh, I needed to go there because there's Hobbiton apparently there, and that's uh, was was very uh, very good to know. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is kind of an opportunity to to rethink science for me, and and I do want to share this with others because I think uh, we should. Um, I think we should take these opportunities. Um, you know, as Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I believe that a lot of barriers to science, progress, and medicine is related to this. Um, I, do, uh, I do believe that community engagement is quite critical uh, for these efforts to be successful um, and, and long-term investment in the communities that need uh, these kinds of advancements. Um, I've been uh, become very involved with, with Black communities um, connected to Mayo and, and, and thinking with them about participatory and citizen science uh, along the lines of what I'm seeing in New Zealand uh, and really allowing science questions to be shaped by the community. Um, I think um, we often conduct science in a silo and, and that, that doesn't serve uh, everybody well um, and also be accountable to answer their questions in a timely manner as you move our science forward um, and really let people be partners instead of subjects. Um, I think that we all have blind sides and, and they, they have a lot of wisdom and experience through generations of dealing with these problems and understanding them in a different way that a lot of us just um, haven't even thought about. Um, so part of those efforts is, you know, this is my research team and um, neighbors and friends and families as we bring them together, because I think this is really the answer to a lot of these questions is to uh, really mingle and, and understand people's problems. Um, a lot of the things I've learned from the communities in New Zealand, or they came forward with information that was not published anywhere, nobody's ever heard, uh, because they had never shared it with anyone. And that may be very relevant to what they're experiencing um, uh, with these very uh, increased rates. So I think um, we need the trust of people to, to really get access to the information we need to help them. Um, and it is our duty to, uh, uh, to really um, enable that trust and, and uh, allow them into our houses and families and, and not just uh, us into their house and their families and taking away information from them. They should also, um, you know, be able to, to know who we are so that they can trust us. So um, with that, happy to, to uh, answer any questions at the end. Looking forward to a great discussion.